All right, I've never done one of these before, but I'm gonna do a book review and some of my top ideas and um, uh, um, things I've learned from a book. And it's a book that literally has changed my mind and my thoughts and my pre um, notions, um, uh, ideas about math. Um, it's called Mathematical Mindsets. And um, if you haven't read it and you're a math teacher, K through college, it doesn't matter where you're at, um, this is a book you need to read. So let me back up here a little bit. I'm taking a class about this book. And um, I was thinking ahead of time, I'll just kind of skim through it and, and pick some things out to write about the questions for the class and, and you know get this done. And I, sh I shortly realized two or three pages into it that it was gonna be really good. And so I read it in detail, took additional notes to the questions that I was asked. And um, uh, like I said, this book is rock star status. Really, really, really good stuff. Um, so one of the things that I really want to dive into here in the next couple minutes is the myth, um, the stigma, some of the misconceptions about math. And I'll just kind of go through these and some, some things that um, I learned through this book that disprove those misconceptions. Misconception number one, being fast at math is the same as being good at math. Now this is a, something that I personally struggled with as a kid especially in elementary school. Um, I didn't really realize it until later, but I was um, uh, um, struggling with my math facts. And I remember I was probably in second or third grade and being pulled aside um, uh, almost every day for a good semester to work on my math facts with a, um, a, a pair up, essentially. And so um, that was a situation where I reflect on that and look back on that. I've never been a fast math thinker. I've never been a person that does well on time tests. I've never been a person that does, um, you know, math really fast in my head. So imagine me being a math teacher in public. Whenever there's a mental math question that pops up, everyone turns and looks at you and goes, "So what's the answer?" Like I'm some kind of walking calculator. That's not really the case. Uh, if anyone other math teachers out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but that misconception is is tough on kids, on students, because they see other students finishing earlier, and they think they understand less than those students. Um, in contrast, I was always a student that finished tests at the very end. Um, I actually had some anxiety with testing because I would see everyone around me finishing early and then I would start to wonder why am I not done yet? And the bell would ring and I'd either not be done or I'd hand in the test just, just enough to be done and, and you know pass. But I look back on that and that anxiety I think stemmed from the fact that I was never that fast at math. Even though I understood it very well, um, uh, I was wondering why was I not completing these tasks as quickly as other students. So I have a lot of personal connections with this. And, um, uh, and one of the interesting things in the book here it talks about with that misconception is the fact that um, speed does not translate smart. In a lot of cases, the, the mathematicians in the real world are slowing down more than they are speeding up. And they're not flying through the stuff. They're really taking their time in deeper understanding of what's going on. And um, uh, I think oftentimes as a teacher, I myself even say, hey, you got that really quick. You're, you know, you understand it completely. But then once I look at the fact that they're doing some more hands-on stuff, they are some of the first ones that struggle with that. And the conceptual um, uh, spatial understanding is really tough for those students. So um, don't confuse kids by giving them time tests. I know that's tough for some people to hear, but that's not a good thing. And, and, and this, there's a lot of research and data behind that to show that. Misconception number two is that people are born with math type genetics where their brains are designed to um, uh, be good at math. And that one is a, a hard one for some people to understand, but um, uh, everyone is capable of solving math problems and everyone's capable of understanding numbers and how they interact and how they work with one another. And like I said earlier with the first misconception is it's not based on speed. It's more based on um, uh, taking that time and finding different ways to connect with those numbers. So th th in the book, it talks about a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And I'll give you an example. A fixed mindset is I'm going to give you a problem. You have to solve it this way. There's only one answer and that is it. So there's no other ways to look at that problem. A growth mindset is giving them a question that they have ability to solve it in different ways, um, look at it in different ways and explain it in different ways than their peers. And they use some examples of problems that could be growth mindset questions um, in comparison to a fixed question and um, uh, how we can use that to teach students in a better way. It's actually really interesting, but one of the things that um, uh, is celebrated in the book is mistakes. 
And that can go along with the third misconception is that failure is bad, mistakes are bad. If you make mistakes, you actually are not learning math. Um, it's really cool, but what they did is they did a brain study and um, uh, uh, what they looked at was when students miss questions in math. And it says in the book, even during the study, if students didn't realize they made a mistake, they still grew because of that. There's a, um, a, a spark in the brain that basically kicks off whenever there's growth. And that spark was greater when a question was missed in comparison to when a question was gotten, was like, was answered correctly. So uh, think about that from the standpoint, even if I had no idea I missed the question and I miss it, my brain grows more than if I got the question right, which seems kind of weird, but it's, a, it's really an interesting thought to, to relay to our students. If we can get them to understand that failure and mistakes are actually welcome in the classroom and how we deal with those, and, and we tell them, hey, your brain just grew because of that, I think it's a huge shift in mindset of what students think about themselves and if they're capable of solving these math questions. So that, that, those two misconceptions are huge in any kind of classroom. And um, I know it's really weird to say we need to celebrate mistakes and celebrate failure, but at the same time, it's how we respond to that and, and uh, having the students understand what's going on in their brains, I think is, is even more important than to say, hey, great job, you missed a question. And um, uh, get them to understand that they grew because of that. Um, one thing that really challenged me with the growth mindset versus fixed mindset was with my girls, my younger daughters. It says in the book that if you um, praise them for fixed attributes, so if I say to my daughter, you are smart, that's actually gonna be bad for her in the long run because um, once she misses a question, she's gonna think it's based on her ability to be smart. If I turn around and say instead, hey, you're, you worked really hard for that, or I like the way you think about that, or great job solving that problem, based it more off their effort, they're gonna be more willing to battle through those mistakes and battle through that failure and um, uh, try harder questions because of it. They did a really quick study in the book with a, um, a, a, a group of students where they gave um, a, a similar question, the exact same question to two groups of students. After the question, they gave two types of praise. The first type of praise was fixed praise, where it was more fixed on one type of attribute, like you're really smart. The second type of praise was, I really appreciated how hard you worked on that question. Regardless of the outcome, got it right or wrong, that's how they praised those students. They then gave the exact same students a second question, and they gave them a choice this time. They said, hey, you can solve a easier question you're more likely to get right, or a tougher question that you might get wrong. Um, big surprise, but those students that were given the fixed praise, they chose the easier question because they were afraid of making a mistake and then in result, looking dumb and not looking smart. The students that were given the praise on their effort and their, their attitude towards the problems and the um, things that were not fixed, that were more based on growth, they chose, a majority of them chose the tougher problem. So once again, not just the fact of what type of problems are we giving our students, but how are we wording our praise when we praise them? And I, that's one thing that I was really shocked with when I read this book was the amount, like I thought praise was all praise is good, right? Like it's great to tell students they're smart and they're doing great, but in reality, some of it can be counterproductive in what message you're trying to get across to your students throughout the year. I could go on for a long time about this book and I, I will spare you um, the details because I could talk about this for an hour, but I'm going to um, end up with one last misconception. And this misconception is probably not going to be popular across the math world, but um, uh, I, I do, like reading this book changed my mind on this philosophy. And it says that the misconception is that because we teach math, we have to assign a lot of homework. Um, I traditionally don't assign a lot of homework. I would say maybe one assignment a week with 10 traditional questions. Um, the one thing I did realize after going through this book is that most of the questions I've been given in the past are all fixed questions. Like you either get it right or you get it wrong not based on things like reflection and things like that allow my students to grow. So um, uh, the misconception is the fact that if students don't get homework, if they're not given homework, they will not retain, they will not practice, they will not understand the math that we're teaching. The, the study in the book shows that students that were given homework and students that were not given homework, there's no difference. And that to me was shocking enough. Like, there was no benefit to giving a bunch of homework every single night. And um, I know that's one thing that I, if I talk to people in public, so I approach someone and, and a common place I get talked to about math for some reason is that when I get my hair cut. 
So I go get my hair cut and I, I'm in a, in a different place, you know, I don't know the people. And they're cutting my hair, one of the first questions they ask is, what do you do for a living? And I tell them, I'm a math teacher. And you'd be surprised, and I'm sure if you're a math teacher, you can relate, the responses that I get. So I get one response of, oh, I love math. And that shows, once again, the emotional connection people have to math. The second response I get is, oh, I hate math. And one of the first reasons they say they hate math is because they just have all these poor and bad memories of when they were kids and they had all their homework. It's, it's talked about in the book, and I think it's extremely important to think about the amount of stress that this is putting on parents, kids, and uh, families when they're just drowned with homework and they're, they're doing 30 questions a night of the same thing over and over again. Now, I'm not saying that you have to completely go the other way and completely get rid of every assignment you ever do, but think about what's going to benefit your students the most. Uh, if you understand that they understand what they're doing, why drill them until they don't like it anymore? Um, I really have been challenged with this idea of homework. I'm brainstorming ideas for myself for the future. And um, one of those things that they suggest doing is more reflective type questions. So rather than solve X, Y, Z, it's more of how do you solve X, Y, Z? And not just that, but what did you learn this week? What did you learn from class? Reflect on this question. Um, a good way to, to test their brains a little bit of how they understand is give them a question that's solved incorrectly and then have them go through and explain what that student could have done differently. I'm not saying get rid of all homework whatsoever, but I am challenging you to think, what can we do differently as math teachers? And that's K through college, like I said earlier. Um, I know it's, a, it's once again a tough thing to debunk. It's a tough thing to, to tell math teachers that. Um, and it's a tough thing for me to think about and to challenge myself with. And anytime you have change. So my challenge to you is to take some of these ideas and see if you can implement them in your own classroom. And um, I'm gonna do the same. But my challenge to you is take one little thing. Take something that you're going to do differently this school year coming up and what are you gonna change about your classroom that's gonna be a positive thing? Is it gonna be how you praise your students? Is it gonna be what kind of a homework you assign? Is it going to be how you teach them about their brain, about how their brain grows through mistakes? Whatever it may be, just find one positive change and make it, make it throughout the school year and you'd be surprised what difference that'll make. So, like I said, pick up this book. I know I got mine um, uh, through the course that I was taking, but I know Amazon has it. Um, very good, very, very good book. And um, it, it looks boring at first glance, but it is rock star. It's really good. So um, that's my first attempt at a book review and my conclusion of my class. I'm gonna go enjoy summer a little bit. Thanks.